Hey, 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 a little surprise live for y'all on this Sunday afternoon. I am here with my man, Emmanuel. Before he talks, I want to kind of set the, the scene. Um, so as a lot of you know, the past three years, I have been really focused on a program called the Private Equity Fund Incubator. Uh, it's been just an amazing experience. And one of the reasons it's been amazing is uh, being able to work with people like Emmanuel. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that happens that I realized pretty quickly was that even this concept of uh, joining a private equity fund, starting to uh, work with other people that maybe you didn't know even before uh, starting that fund, uh, and then learning all of the intricate aspects of, you know, from the very beginning, thinking like a fund manager, understanding how to create ROI, uh, building out the legal aspects of the fund, uh, starting to put together the, the everything from the just how the GPs are going to be compensated to how the LPs are going to be compensated, then coming up with the strategy for the fund and the target, targeting the deals and all of that. And so, uh, it's always going to attract people that are thinking a little more sophisticated. You know, there are a lot of folks that, you know, are, are just trying to figure out, okay, how can I put together some, some Facebook ads? Or how can I start this business or get into e-commerce? This usually is going to be a, a little bit different person that's even interested in starting a fund from scratch. And so that was one of the things that was really cool. So people that reached out were just very, very talented. And of uh, all of those folks, you know, Emmanuel was one of, of one of the folks that, that stood out and that we uh, was kind of a, an immediate end uh, in for uh, Pefi 4. And now he's uh, been lead on a deal negotiated, worked that deal. We partnered with another fund on that deal. And so one of the cool things is that he's gotten to um, really experience a lot of different levels. And so I wanted him to talk from that perspective because one is, you know, obviously uh, the interaction between uh, the other people that are the GPs in, in the fund and starting to be a leader among them because in his fund, his was the first deal. So just that dynamic and then working with the seller of the business. And, you know, in this case, there were, you know, 17, 18 employees and taking over uh, that. And then, you know, just a lot of clients and, and, and that kind of thing, but learning all of those dynamics while managing the relationship with the other fund uh, and then you kind of extrapolate from, from that and, and trying to grow the business with all of these different parties. Uh, so he's done an amazing, amazing job. So today we're going to learn a little bit about his background, what got him interested in uh, becoming a, a general partner of a fund, uh, some of those initial lessons, and then talk about his experience uh, managing, running, and doing a great job of, of growing uh, his his acquisition and, and deal that's in the portfolio. Welcome, Emmanuel. So let's start, man. Let's start. Let's jump right in. I, I mean, you Good have a, an incredible uh, background. And, uh, you know, the thing that impressed me was just the apparent willingness to hustle. So share a little bit about your background and story. Okay. Um, well, let's start off with Ever since I was young, I have always wanted to do something in business. Like my nature, when I'm not doing anything, it always moves towards business. I don't know why. It's maybe how I'm wired. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I definitely think there are people that are wired that way. Uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and one of the things that's interesting is a lot of people I know that are wealthy, like they made a conscious decision when they were young. It's like, you know what? I want to be rich <laughs> and they get really interested in, in business. So I, I think there is a wiring that goes. With okay. That. That's, that's good. I got, I guess I'm, I'm built for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I didn't know how to start a business, run a business, but that thought of running a business was always in my head. And I've always been the type to be disciplined, work hard, a hustler, and just Whenever, whatever I set my mind to, I, I always achieve it. And one day I was working out in the gym and one guy in, approaches me. He's like, do you want to work with me? And I was like, what do you do? He's like, I have an insurance broker. And 
I'm not smart, but I listen to smart people. And he drives a luxury car. So at, at that time, I was just like, okay, he's doing something right. He's doing something right. What do I got to lose? I took that opportunity and it was a life changing because I, I started to learn about sales, marketing, leadership, systems, procedures, everything about business. And through that experience, I was slowly building my skills of being an entrepreneur and building lifelong skills. And one day I was at a, an event with my friend and he asked me, oh, are you looking for uh, a job right now? Because we're looking to expand. And I'm like, what company? Well, we sell Google Street View. And I was just like, Google Street View. He's like, yeah. I'm like, set me up for an interview and let's see where this goes. So I got the interview and then I got the job. I don't, it was a door-to-door -door position. Mm -hmm. And basically the concept was, you know, the Google Street View. We talk to the business owners and we bring that concept inside the business. Uh... And I don't know about you guys, but I, I live by like Toronto, Canada, and it's really cold during the winter time. So there was a point where I have to make a presentation to the owner. I was wearing a toque. I had my gloves. I have to, I have an iPad that I have to make the presentation. So once I stepped in the door, it's game time. Like you can't say, I feel cold. Nothing can throw you off. You have to be on point. And through that experience, I learned to build grit, uh, persistence, perseverance, because there's times where the weather is your enemy, sometimes yourself, right? There's things that's going on in your brain that's telling you you can't do it. There's doubt. So you learn to overcome those type of things. And that's one experience that I carry throughout my life that's been life changing. And, and I think you have to tell because, you know, people know, oh, yeah, Toronto is cold. But a lot of people haven't experienced those winters. So just <laughs> talk about like what how cold, what were some of the what was the weather on some of the coldest days and a little about what that feels like to be outside going door to door. <laughs> just thinking about it makes me shiver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it's like, you know, there's the worst part is when it's cold and there's wind because it's like minus wind chill. And the cold air just goes to your face and it just freezes it, right? Um, you have to wear layers of clothing. I was wearing yeah. like heat tech, uh, a sweater, uh, a jacket. I got my toque. I got my gloves. I got like two, two layers of socks. <laughs> but what, what would the temperatures get down to? Um, it can go down to negative 20. Uh, like and unimaginable. yeah, it's it's pretty intense and crazy. Um, it can get this worse than that. Also, things, you know, when I found out about Emmanuel and I was I was learning about his background, it's like, oh my goodness, dude! Like that is grit. <laughs> and no, I I don't think I'm special or anything like that. Or I have like I'm not the smartest. I'm not the most talented. But I I do work hard. And through my hard work, I became the na uh, number one salesperson for my district multiple times. Um, I think that's what attracted me to <laughs> uh, this position. Um, yeah. And that's what you liked about my experience. Yeah. And during that time, um, I started to look for side hustles. Uh, first, I did Amazon. And on Amazon, I started selling uh, Kindle. But then I realized that Amazon is the owner of the platform and they can kick you out at any time. You know, you can make making good revenue. And for whatever reason, they can be like, hey, I don't like something about your business or we don't like you or we're building something that's competitive and we don't want your name or your brand on our platform. So I was essentially giving my power away and I didn't like that. Mm. So I moved into Shopify. I did a little bit of um, drop shipping and print on demand. And during that time, I started learning about digital marketing, acquiring customers, essentially running ads and advertising. And there's a couple of people that approach me and I help them grow their business using digital marketing strategies, um, advertising, SEO, uh, email marketing campaign. Once I started to realize that, you know, when growing a business, sometimes you, you gain five customers, sometimes you lose three. And then the next day, you know, it's, it's just changing cycle all the time. And I'm all about growing fast, smart and effective. You know, what, what do I need to do to have that exponential growth? 
Then I came across M and A mergers and acquisition. How about instead of building, you know, getting customers, let's just buy revenue, right? Because overnight you can have access to the market share. You have access to the capital, the talent, the assets, the intellectual property, right? The systems, the procedures. And I'm like, well, if I want to grow a business fast, let's get into mergers acquisition, uh, M&A, yeah. essentially. So I started, this was now the pandemic. And during the pandemic, a lot of businesses got affected. Um, I was looking at many businesses and their numbers were down. And I didn't want my first acquisition to be something that I have to turn around. I want it to be a profitable business that already has the systems that's already stable because I'm not going to be an expert in that particular business. So I looked at different opportunities, um, look at the numbers. It didn't work out for me. I talked to a couple of owners. They're not flexible in terms of their structure. At that time, also, I came across your videos because you were you had some videos that talking about, you know, mergers and acquisition. And then you also had videos about private equity. And I was just like, private equity, what is that? And private equity is the, the model that nobody talks about on the internet, right? It's you, you always hear about marketing agencies, being affiliate, but real wealth, like those Wall Street people, it's private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, yeah. right? The and I was just like, it's different. Like, yeah. They're literally just not even talking about the same thing. Exactly. I was like, why isn't people talking about this? Like nobody's talking about M&A, but private equity also is just a, a level beyond that. Yeah. And I saw you that I saw one of your live and you were saying or recruiting people for your GP position uh, for Pepe 4. And I was just like, you know what? I have to get into this. I yeah. no, I, you know, I messaged Nori a couple of times. Hey, what's the update? <laughs> <laughs> when is my when is my uh, schedule for Ace? I followed up with her and I was just like, OK, once I got into uh, uh, a meeting with you, um, I told you my experience and basically what I did and you liked it. And here we are. Yeah. And that <laughs> first call, uh, you were on with Andrew as well. Yes. And, I was. you know, after the call, Andrew was like, yeah, this, this, this is, uh, this is the guy. Uh, and you know, obviously with, with each one of these, we're, we're putting four to five people in mm -hmm. each fund. And one of the things that has been really cool has been seeing you work with the other guys. It's, it's not like it's like, oh, we find one winner. The goal is, you know, we find five winners. And, uh, you know, that's how we're able to get in and, and really impact a, a business. So let's let's talk about getting into the program. And what were some of those kind of paradigm shifts that, um, I mean, having studied buying businesses and looked at things around uh, mergers and acquisitions, even from that way of thinking, you know, what were some of the things that uh, kind of uh, were, were paradigm shifts as far as thinking like a private equity fund manager? Well, first of all, I want to say that the program structure is one of the best. Um, it's one of the best programs I've ever taken. <laughs> and it's just the structure. So for the listeners and viewers, the first thing that we do is we first get a better understanding of how to think uh, like a private equity, right? It is very powerful because it's a paradigm shift. It's a different way of thinking and a different way of viewing the world through a different lens. So that's the first step. The second step is the case study. You know, we see proof of, okay, this, this is what we talked about and this is how they applied it, right? This is this particular private equity look this is the proof of how they structured the deal as we were like exactly. okay it's like always it's always an epiphany it's just yeah. like oh okay now it makes sense combining the the theory and the case studies is this is basically like an mba right because we have okay we, we see how it's done and this is the real world experience or practical things that they did and then the next stage after that, once we have that shift in terms of this is how they think, this is what they do. Now we get into the practical of, OK, now you see what they do. Now we're going to be acquiring businesses and apply the things that we learn. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's the goal is, 
you know, one of my things after, um, you know, training and working with people for, for a long time was like, I really want to bring people on a journey. Yeah. You know, like there's plenty of anybody can go out and create video programs. Uh, anybody can come up with kind of the next coaching thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but my thought behind the incubator was let's just go do it. Like if it really does work, yeah. <laughs> why not just go and and, and do it together? Uh, and that's why that has been like, like uh, just really rewarding. And I, I think one of the cool things, even for me, is it's a constant reminder. You know, we're going through those case studies and we're looking at deals where, you know, uh, funds are, are walking away with $80 million on a business that was losing money. Mm -hmm. But because they understood financial engineering and, you know, s structured the, the deal on the front end the right way and exited the right way, it's like, wow, like the it's you start to realize that whatever problem you're facing in your business it's a matter of creativity and mm -hmm. having the right structure. And things become really, really tough if you're just a business owner that owns an LLC and you're uh, managing a business within that LLC. All of a sudden, this whole world of possibilities open up based on structure. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, one of the reasons that we uh, took Fiji public is because you know, the reason people go public, it, it just opens up a whole other world of possibilities as far as how and when you profit from that business. And it's the same thing in funds. It's like when you're in that fund structure, it changes what you're capable of accomplishing uh, in, in that business, which makes it really, really uh, yeah. cool and exciting. There's uh, a couple of readings and case studies where we saw the importance of the structure and the creativity was more important than the money or you know the the loans or the lend the loan to value or and just yeah. it's just mind blowing in terms of how they structure deals you know this is not something that you you see on a regular basis and the beautiful thing about being in a group of you know the this caliber is everybody has different types of experience yeah right everybody comes from different types of uh, industries, fields, and there's something that they can bring to the table. Yeah. And when we were going through the case studies, you know, everybody, there's there's a lesson or a part where everybody shares their thoughts and their feedback on what we did or what we read. And there's things that I didn't see, but other people saw. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is important, but other people saw, I said something else. And it gave me, it was a good place for a teamwork because there's different areas where we can support each other and we have you know different perspectives in terms of approaching a business or let's say you know once we took over the the internet business uh they had a different type of input versus what i had right yeah. so which is which is very uh a diverse and highly experienced and highly skilled group so uh, amazing. Yeah, I, I think that part can't be understated because you start to realize even when each of you go out and do your own fun, the importance of having input from different people. You know, I was um, with a, a buddy of mine last night who, um, you know, is a trader at a Wall Street fund. And I was talking about some of the things and some of my thinking even as far as uh, the Fiji, our, our publicly traded company. And some of his thinking and input was like, whoa, dude, I was <laughs> not thinking about it that way, but you're exactly right. Like we should be doing this other thing and, and that kind of thing. And so just having that village mentality uh, as opposed to kind of the solo and, and everybody kind of wants to be the solopreneur and mm -hmm. be off in their own little island doing their own thing. <laughs> but this is a, a team sport, you yep. know. Uh, and so having your team of people, obviously, you know, even you know, when you're when you start to work with attorneys and accountants and, and some of those other things, um, you know, that is ex it should be exciting. It should be exciting to be able to work with those other folks and include them in deals and include yep. them in, in putting together uh, JVs and just understanding your limitations. Like I know it took me a while, uh, but I realized early on like, oh, like I thought, 
you know, when I was young, when I bought my first business, like the path was to have one business, own it forever and, you know, be like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. It's like you have your Larry Ellison, you have your one thing and you just run that forever. Warren Buffett, you know, the list goes on. And so those were kind of the examples. And then my first business went out of business and mm -hmm. failed. And I was like, I guess that's it. I'm a failure. <laughs> this is Not the in the private team. equity world. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously a lot of people know my story. I met a guy who flipped hospitals and I realized, oh, like I could just go from thing to thing to thing. I should, when I had my first seven figure offer, for the first thing, I should have sold it. I'm not, I don't even want to run one thing for, for my whole life. My ADD is way too bad for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. Um, and so understanding yourself allows you to align yourself with, with the other folks that kind of match uh, your capabilities and where you lack. Uh, but I knew this was going to be a really great deal for you. Uh, you know, obviously you partnered with a with with another fund. And so you guys are, are kind of working together. But talk about just that experience of because you, you had you bought a business before on your own. This no, is your first acquisition. This, that, was, that was my first. There's a couple yeah. of deals that I was looking at, but it fell through because the, the owner changed their mind last minute. Yeah. So talk about that experience. Your first deal, you're, you're negotiating. You got this. You got a seller who's he's pretty savvy. Uh, you got a bunch of employees that you got to take over. He's kind of checking out of the business. Yeah. Um, and then you got to coordinate with this other fund to make sure everybody's on board and, and get everything situated and transferred and accounts. And, you know, yeah. it's a lot that goes into buying a business. And so talk about going through that process, not even just being on your own, but but having, you know, the fund and, and all of that involved. So. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that the other fund is involved because this is that business is a lot wow. of work. <laughs> a lot. Um, first, going through the, the due diligence process, um, understanding the business more, uh, understanding what's going on with the project managers, the employees, how they're all over the world. It's 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 a it was a great experience. It's an international business. Yeah, like, what's really crazy, like literally Europe, South America, like all over know, the world. International. <laughs> yeah. So well, and employees and we have to work on people's time zones, which is sometimes can be difficult because of, you know, we want work to get done fast. Um, you know, it's a rush project. And uh, one of our animators is in Russia. <laughs> so yeah. that was a uh, uh, one important. sec. I just want to make sure I see what I got. I'm going to go through the comments in a sec. So feel free to put. Uh, your questions and I am keeping an eye. I did see we had somebody say that the audio is broke is broken, but I don't understand what audio is broken on white right side means. Is are you saying a manual on the right? Can you hear me? Let me just put a comment in that we're good audio wise. If y'all can hear us, okay. I I hear you great. So you should, yeah, should be good. Should be okay. And according to the settings, yeah, I'm good. Be good. I'm just okay. Sounds fine. All right. I just okay. didn't want to come. We're getting good stuff. <laughs> I did not want to miss this. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank y'all. I, I appreciate that. All right. So um, yeah. So oh. but going through that process, you're talking a little bit about the the due diligence and uh, what what that was. was yeah, like. just uh, verifying everything, looking at the business, the numbers. The production and during the due diligence we saw a great opportunity yeah. because of there are some things that the business owner wasn't really taking care of because he mentally checked out of the business but once we saw the opportunity to make the changes we saw way greater potential and how of a great deal it is for both funds um, that was one of the things that was very helpful because of we knew what to do right after we, we created a 90 day game plan in terms of, okay, once we take over the business, this is what we need to do. And I, as the lead had to assign tasks to people in my, in the fund uh, to the general partners and also the project managers in terms of how can we get the most value out of the business? Um, and, and that was a, a pretty good, 
it was not pretty it was an amazing experience and it was like a sprint because everybody had to make sure that they're they're hitting the deadline you know we're, we're, we're talking to uh the necessary vendors we're, we're making the changes in terms of the business and making because in the fund we only have a certain time frame and i always emphasize that on the project man uh, not the project the general partners because there is only a certain time that we have to turn this business around before we move on into the next project so um, we have to work with a lot of urgency we have to have a we have to have a good communication in terms of all level all the partners and just more importantly the execution and just executing on the the timing um the, the type of work and if there's any assistance for for getting things done. Yeah, you know, and, and with each deal, I think it's really interesting. One of the things that we're really focused on, and Emmanuel and I were talking a little bit before this about a deal that we we just uh, recently closed. And in both in, in most of the cases, what we're trying to look for is basically a neglected business, a business that's still making money, things are humming along, but you know, the, the owner, for whatever reason, is, is checked out. One, you know, was that it, he was just involved in some other projects. And so it checked out. And, and another deal that we did in this fund, uh, it was health issues. Um, and so the owner was was checked out. But in in those cases, still, you've got you've got to look at kind of the ship. And so we knew going into uh, the the business that Emmanuel was leading, we knew going into that business that it was kind of a big ship. And so when you're in a big ship and you're trying to, uh, you know, change course, it just takes a lot of long time. You kind of have all these rowers and you got to get them aligned and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you got to get them re-motivated and, and that kind of thing. And so when we're going to that deal, we're taking that into consideration to make sure, all right, this may not be a business that doubles or triples um, over the course, especially in the short term fund. So how are we going to still, we still in every deal we want to do, we want to double, triple our return. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a deal and kind of one of the things that we moved to after that 90 day sprint, which is really focused on operations, really focused on marketing. Then we move into financial engineering to figure out, all right, what does it look like for us to still get a massive return on this deal? And, you know, the reason that you're always planning on double or tripling the each deal is that uh, it's not going to work every time. So you may get a deal and it just totally blows up and it doesn't work. And so you're really minimizing your risk, which I think our deal structure did really well in, in this, but then maximizing that that upside. And, you know, to just suppose that, you know, we have another deal where, you know, instead of 20 some odd employees, it's it was one. And um, he it was still a business that was making money with 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 the owner neglecting it. And in that deal. You know, we're just talking about some of some of the numbers. We're barely scratching the surface on that one, but it's a it was a one man canoe. <laughs> and so <laughs> instead of the big ship that that uh, Emmanuel's having to captain, um, it was a one man canoe. So you know, we got the other we got the one guy overboard, and now we can get four people that are 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 in that canoe with with the fund managers and really go hard and you know we've already seen even before we get all four just with doing some very simple things we took that business and we did triple the side the the just the the gross revenue of that business um since last month which is like really really you know really crazy really shocking because we haven't started our 90-day sprint so we, we do our 90-day sprint uh, but sometimes it's just really low hanging fruit. And so when you're looking at deals, you want to understand that you're not every business, you know, if it's if it's too big of a business, which is one of the reasons that I like smaller deals in general, is that if you're looking for a 200, 300 percent return, it's tough to do that. Uh, if you're dealing with a $10 million business versus mm -hmm. a half a million dollar business. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you can get, it's it's almost like the day trader where you're in and out um, as opposed to kind of the long-term trade where, yeah, you can make a lot of money on that larger deal long-term, but there's a lot to be said for just a 300% return, no matter how small the deal is. Um, but what, do you know, you've seen that. I'm, I'm curious on your perspective, like obviously, 
Uh, you know, we have one of the other GPs that's that's in a deal where it's a little bit more of like, all right, just tick this, tick this, you know, double, triple, you know, we may be able to double this thing even after the, the triple we saw this month. Um, so being in a deal that is a little more like kind of steady as you go and, and making these small changes, kind of tell me your perspective on, on, uh, on that. Well, w- with this particular business, there's a lot of employees. So yeah. we have to do a great job of managing the project managers and making sure that everybody is aligned to the company culture, the vision. And as leaders of the company, we have to do a great job of, you know, the other PEFI fund manager, we have to do a great job of leading the company to the next level and to where we want it. And that is something that we communicate with the, with the organization consistently. And one of the things that they're looking for was opportunities for you know taking the business to the next level as previously mentioned the the previous owner um kind of checked out in the business so they're looking for somebody to talk to somebody that's more hands-on and i definitely um gave them that opportunity and also you know got their i got their voices to be heard essentially Yeah. yeah yeah which is i think that's crucial you know, when there's a uh, number one is transition. If somebody knew somebody else was checked out, are you really going to leave the business <laughs> and, and take this to the next level? Yeah. And I, I think y'all did an amazing, amazing job of that. Uh, all right. So we got to get the likes up. First <laughs> of all, we got a few comments in here. Feel free to put in any questions that you have uh, for uh, Emmanuel. I saw a couple pop up, uh, but be sure to like the video uh, and we'll go through some of these questions, man. Had uh, c- conducting tomfoolery jumped in earlier. Uh, said, what's up, Ace? Darius, thanks for popping in. Um, this one is something you're right. I need to do. He says, you know, if you premiere this 60 to 15 minutes uh, before the, the viewer count increases almost 3x. So yes, I got to do that. Some somebody mentioned that before, uh, and and really, I just need to set it up. Uh, probably Nori, as soon as she gets these scheduled, can uh, go ahead and, and plug that in. Um, tech sales are definitely a gold mine. I think he's referring to when you were doing the door to door sales. So this is an interesting question. What's the profit mar? What was that profit margin per? sale when you're doing that tech sale as much as you're able to share like what what how much would a sale be and then do you have any idea what their margins were i didn't i don't know the particular margins they didn't share that with us okay yeah what was the size of the the sale like when you so um they could be five hundred dollars per per uh, business or uh-huh. it could range sometimes it could be even three thousand dollars okay. so it depends on oh, what they fine. want and what they would like to uh, we have different packages and it's very yeah. customizable so it depends on the business owners wants and needs and then we provide them a solution in terms of what they want awesome awesome, awesome. This was in response to those those cold. I can't. I thought it. I can't believe it's already three degrees. Manny was telling me before we jumped on. It's like three degrees up there. Like I thought. Like October was still kind of fall weather. Uh, yeah, I, I went to school upstate New York, and after you know we got we, it was pretty much level with uh, Montreal. Okay. And so after a few winters there, it's like never again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is interesting. He says, man, I really suck at selling. Do you have any, any quick tip that you would, you would give somebody who's uh, trying to improve their own sales? Well, I wasn't good at sales in the beginning. Um, just yeah. like a skill, it's something you can develop. I'm actually an introvert. So I get energy when I'm alone. You, you see these books, you know, my yeah. Friday night would be chilling yeah. by myself, reading, learning. But the best way to get good at sales is first, don't read any books. Just put yourself into that position. Mm -hmm. Just start talking to people, solve a problem. Sales is essentially you providing a solution for their problem. Does your product 
provide a solution to their problem. And your job is to communicate that, have the energy. And more importantly, this is the number one tip I can give to you is sell something that you believe in. Mm. When I was selling Google Street View, I believe in the product because I know what it did to the customers and how much it changed their life. If it wasn't a product that I believe in, then I have zero chance of being successful selling that product. And then once you start getting in-field experience, then you can start learning about, you know, reading. Um, you can start pra obviously practicing and going through the scripts. Just like a basketball player, you know, there's repetition when you shoot, right? You get that muscle memory. Now, when it comes to selling, you need to develop that muscle memory when you have the presentation, objection handling, the tonality, how you approach people, right? The pauses, you know, there's different types of skills involved in it. But at the end of the day, it is a skill and it is something that everybody can learn. And it's, you look at the, all the billionaires, they all did a sales position. So it's very valuable to this marketplace or in the world. So it's something that you should have in your arsenal. Yep. Um, I, I think the, the real key is, is it takes practice. It, it's almost like saying, you know, I'm not, it's really the same. I'm not good at basketball. You know, you could read all day long about basketball, watch all day long basketball games, but until you get out there and start practicing, um, you don't get, get good at it. And so, you know, whether that's, hey, I'm just going to, you know, start selling some product that really is owned by other people or uh, get an agreement with some with a friend that owns a business like, hey, I'm going to help you sell the, these T-shirts. Getting that experience is really valuable. And if you can, I think the, the real key is if you can treat it like a game. The biggest issue that keeps people from starting to get experience selling is that they put a bunch of pressure uh, on themselves and a bunch of stress around like, oh, am I going to get the sale? And I think when you can treat it like, you know, just like we talk, like basketball, if you can treat it like a missed shot. Yeah. It's like, oh, like, what did I do wrong there? How can I improve? And, you know, it's not this thing of like devastation that uh, you you were told no. Uh, I think that is a, a really big part of it of just, hey, it's it's a game. I'm, I'm here to play. And, you know, when I win, great. And when I don't, how can I improve? Yeah, there's there's one saying, you know, in sales that we have is have the freedom of outcome. If they say yes, all right, you can celebrate. But if they say no, it doesn't matter. On to the yeah. next one, right? You, you can never be attached to the result. It's just freedom from outcome. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Dare says, yeah. uh, private equity and m &A is America's best kept, yeah. kept wealth building secret. That's I, facts. I 100% agree. Uh, and there's nobody that's really motivated to share it. And I think one of the other reasons that I do things in this incubator is that even if it were shared, it's you have to experience it. Um, you know, people that own funds or start funds, they come from either other funds <laughs> that, that they worked at or uh, Wall Street where they were just heavily exposed to the strategies and, and all that. Uh, and so I, I think it's one of those things that's very difficult even to pass on. It's, it's not like trading, uh, which is why we don't hear about it as much. Uh, it's something where you really do want to go through the full experience because each one of those things is a long term process, you know, creating the fun, uh, understanding how to, to create it, um, starting to raise capital for the fun, starting to look at deals for, for the fun, starting to close deals, understanding how, you know, obviously we do 90 day sprint, but how to take over those businesses and and run those businesses. Then understanding how to maximize your ROI, ROI while you own those businesses, and then uh, starting to exit and negotiate those exits, and understanding that and the timing and who to approach and how to approach. It's just yep. there's so many moving parts at each thing that it's not just like oh here's this strategy like Emmanuel said. It's 
you have to download a way of thinking, almost this modus operandi, where you're going into the situations and you just know, okay, here, it doesn't matter what the situation is. You can't just say, oh, the graph looks like this, <laughs> or the graph looks like this, and the volume is this, then you, you make this trade. It's impossible to put those rules in place. So it takes uh, the experience. And so while some might say, oh, it's this big conspiracy thing, I just think it's it's too complicated uh, a thing, and and it's also why I'm I'm not as big a fan of the you know courses and things. Where it's like, oh, just go do this the, here one, two, or three, because it just doesn't work that way. And when you're going to, especially when you're going to have other people invest, I, I don't. I think that goes beyond. Hey, I'm just going to play this game. You know, it goes beyond. Oh, I'm risking my money in Facebook, so I'm going to take this course. Uh, and then be go and start to do it. You know, once you start to raise money from other people and, you know, I just think even on the other end, once you're going to do deals, you know, I, I feel a responsibility. I think, you know, I'm very proud of, of in all the deals that we've done and all the peppies that have employees, uh, just like Emmanuel, I'm very proud of how we've treated the employees. We're not going in there like corporate raiders and mm -hmm. just you know, get rid of it like, oh, we don't care about the people, that kind of thing. Um, so it's like you have a responsibility on all of these different levels, responsibility uh, to your investors, responsibility to the seller when you've got some fight. You know, in this case, you know, the, the seller has a lot on the line. He's put his money on, on the line when it comes to this. Um, and then you've got the the employees and clients. It's just a when you, you're not just starting something from scratch, you're going into this thing. And these are complex deals. And in our other deal, you know, we have a lot of small businesses that are coming to us and they're depending on us for the success of, of their business. So I, I say all that to say um, it, it is a, a, a secret, but I don't think it's like a conspiracy th secret. I think it's just the dynamics of what it is, but it's also an amazing moat. Like once you get this game very few people get it, mm -hmm. especially once you get it in, in from the perspective of I've done deals uh, and and made deals work uh, like what we're talking about today. Anything you would add to, to that about it being the. No, it's I was just going to say that there's a lot of moving parts in M&A and private equity. So um, you just basically uh, said what I was going to say. And um, when you talked about that, that shifting of thinking. Imagine like uh, your cell phone, you have an Apple, you have to download the new iOS update. And it's, that's what you're doing with this particular process and program, right? There was, when I was buying or when I was in the process of buying a business for myself, I, I was reading m and books. But then when I was actually, I bought the business and I was just like, okay, Everything went out the window and it was just like, all right, like practical, practical. Yeah. Let's you're, get this. you're literally like set down <laughs> on the treadmill and it's going full speed. Yeah. <laughs> you better start. You better be ready to run. Exactly. But it, it's been a great experience. And um, but yeah, um, I, I think on the wealth building side of this, it is it is this really cool thing uh, that, you know, I, I've talked about this on the channel before. I think the unique thing is we all have to become fund managers at some point. Yep. Uh, and so like, you know, we're all expected at the end of our life is the, kind of the, the traditional way that it happens. You're kind of kicked out of your job, you're retired and you have all this money. And now you're essentially a fund manager. And the mm -hmm. really devastating thing is that you're a fund manager, but your livelihood depends on how you manage those funds, because if you don't manage them correctly and, you know, you don't have enough to retire you are stuck. You got to go yeah. and work again and be a Walmart greeter and all these other things. And so to get to the end and, and that be your very first time ever managing a fund is crazy. Uh, and so that that's part of the other big part of this is, you know, I encourage everybody to get into this game because you're in it. <laughs> you're just saving your money and putting it into a fund for your whole life. Uh, and then your first time managing it is when, you know, it's it's uh, almost a life or death kind of situation. So that that's the other part of that. All right. Got to go through a few more of these and get out of here on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, 
Oh, this is what our, we thought the audio might be messed up. Cowboy Del Norte says, Ace, blessings, brother. Says, congratulations, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Good deal. Sounds Still fine. Please. How do you find business operators for your acquisition? Well, one of the things is you just buy a business with the operators. Um, so, you know, the, the great thing, you know, when, when you're at a fund, we're saying no to a lot more deals than we're saying yes to. Uh, you know, like we talked about the different criteria. The first thing that we're looking for is a business that is profitable, that is neglected. The longer it's been neglected, the better. You know, if you got a business like this deal we, we just closed, like it's been neglected for a year be, because of the uh, seller's health issues, and and it's still profitable after a year. Uh, and but that's when you're able, just like we said, you know, we, we're at what like two and a half x um, this month from last month. And that happens when there's somebody who's neglecting business. Now, the other part of that is, you know, uh, another criteria. And there's just so many. There's so many things you're looking for, the finance and the business, deal structure, all these different things. But one of those other criteria would be we want um, the, the people that are managing the business, the operator to, to be there. Um, you know, and, and if it's not, then we've got a plan for, for what that looks like. So in Emmanuel's case, the deal had a whole team, um, just everything. The operations is is there. We're just trying to improve systems and improve and grow the business. The second deal we did, the owner was the operator. And so we um, did a deal with an operator. Um, in that case, we basically wanted that operator. Uh, I'm kind of doing a, a different deal like this in Fiji, but you want that operator to have equity. So, you know, the person that's operating the business, they need to be a partner with you in these in these deals. So those would be the kind of two things. If it's if it's ideally you're buying it and the operation is there or in the case of a deal that we, we just did in Emmanuel's fund, um, they're not there and we're replacing them with somebody that's interested in investing in the business along alongside us. Anything you would add to that? Yeah, um, I would say that's the beautiful thing about M&A is that when you build a business, recruiting, finding talent, screening, it takes a lot of time, right? Yeah. When we acquired the internet business, there's already project managers, a salesperson, animators, and we had access to that overnight. So it's like a shortcut. I'm telling you, it's, it is. it's very powerful and it take, it's time consuming when you recruit people, you know, talking to applicants that don't have the alignment to your company values. So that's, I would say that's why M&A is very powerful and it's such a, it's such a hack, I would say. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, Cowboy Dan Norte, thank you, Ace, and thank you, Emmanuel, for the bomb. I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, people in my life, I had mentors and they were giving me nuggets, tips and things like that. So Ace, I posted my um, email in the chat. So if you can just post that, if you have any questions or anything so, that you uh, need help with, yeah. then, you know, feel free to shout, give me an email and I'll be able to maybe uh, help you out or point you to the right direction. So awesome. Awesome. Uh Warren Buffett made a good practice out of being able to leave the owners and current managers in place at the companies that Berkshire bought. Is that yes, one hundred percent? That that's goal. So I, you know, I know you're obviously the questions are coming before we get to the answer, but we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, one hundred percent. That that is the goal. But like I said, we'll also close a deal where that's not the case as long as we have somebody who's gonna run it and and manage it. And, you know, one of the things we see in case studies and one of the things that we've seen in real life with each Peffy is sometimes those people can, if you're getting the right folks, they can end up being the buyers for the business after mm -hmm. the fun uh, is over. Or we've seen it where the a buyer for the business is the lead uh, from the fund. So they end up buying it from the fund uh, after participating as one of the GPs on the deal. They obviously have an inside sense. They already run the business. It just, it's almost like a shortcut for somebody who wants to buy a business and you can get into that business uh, through the fund. 
and then run it, see how what's going on in it, understand the good things, the bad things, all that stuff. You know, so you're you're almost in some ways, you know, we, we talk about this in, in our training. But one of the things you're doing is from the very beginning, like literally everything starts with how are we exiting this? Yep. And then every decision you make, you know, hiring partners, client, all this, all the things, it's like a little bit in the back of your head should be, okay, how could this tie to an exit? You know, maybe we give this client this special deal. We want to pro- go to them because they could be a, a good strategic buyer. Uh, you know, we're going to hire this person because they're interested in buying businesses. They could be a good buy- financial buyer. You know, so you're looking at all of these different things, and that's what makes it a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, amen. I'm in Medicare sales now, looking to quit and be. 100% in my PE firm. That's awesome. Yes, sir. Let's go, man. I love it. That's what I love to hear. Uh, Sigma Enigma out in San Fran says, uh, we all have to become fund managers at some point. That, I think, is one of the most, it was one of my huge realizations. You know, after going through this process, like, wait a minute, this is crazy. Like, I never realized, like, we all, at some point, have to become uh, fund fund managers, and and you know just that idea of maximizing uh, what you get out of uh, of a, of every investment and how you take that out of that investment. Uh, I think it, it does. I mean, w- would you say that this experience has kind of changed how you how you view even the funds that, that you invest personally? Yes, definitely. It's uh, it's it's eye opening and yeah. just looking more on the the end or long-term process in terms of okay at one point i'm going to be doing this for my life or uh, <laughs> uh this is something this that, just like an optional fun yeah thing. I yeah gotta know how, how to do this yes um ace Your connection is a little bit. Hmm. Seems like he's uh, lagging. Technical difficulties, folks. Please be patient. Uh, We're just fixing some stuff. We don't know where Ace went, but we are going to end this live. If you have any questions, hit up Nori or Ace. Um, Make sure you give a like and don't forget to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Uh, It says, we've definitely got to have a conversation about the team needed to really play the sport. Yes, awesome, definitely. And if, like I said, before we disconnect, if you guys want to reach out to me, like, you know, if you have any questions regarding to the program or anything I can help you out with, email me at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T at G-I-G-A-S-C-O dot com. So, all right, we're going to end it here and stay tuned for more podcasts or shows like this. Peace.